It's unusual for me to buy brand new clothes. I get most of what I wear from charity shops. Some people think that anyone who buys things that have already been worn by someone else can't really care much about clothes, but that's not true. You can find some pretty decent stuff in these places, even quite tasteful designer clothes that people, for whatever reason, have decided they don't want anymore. And they only sell clothes that are in good condition, often things that have only ever been worn once or twice. You get to support good causes too, of course, because the money you spend goes to charity. Apparently, dressing smartly is supposed to increase your self confidence, but I've never felt any different in a jacket and tie. And anyway, I'm not the kind of person who spends time worrying about what to put on in the morning. Some people take ages umming and ahhing over what to wear, but I just throw on the first thing I find in my wardrobe and that's it, job done. To be honest, I'd be happy just wearing the same two or three t shirts all the time. The trouble is, I only have time to do my washing once a week, so that wouldn't work. I may not be fashionable, but I'm not dirty. I get suspicious when I go into a clothes shop and see that everything is incredibly cheap. If the prices are so low, then how much are the people who made them getting paid? And what are their working conditions like? I only buy from companies that sell ethical clothing made by people who earn a decent salary and work in a safe environment. I usually get that kind of information online. It's easy enough to find. The clothes may not be as cheap, and there's not necessarily any more guarantee of quality, but at least I can be confident that no one is being exploited. I spend a lot of money on clothes. I don't really care what they cost. They don't have to be designer clothes, but they do have to make me feel good about myself. I like to know that I can get something out of the wardrobe and any feelings of insecurity I have will just disappear as soon as I put it on. Then when I get to work and someone says, hey, that shirt really suits you, it gives me a big lift. And I never wear the same thing more than once in the same month. My colleagues have got used to seeing me in something different every day. If I want to go out and get a new t shirt, for example, then I always have to get rid of an old one first. And I only do that when I can't justify hanging on to it anymore. Either because it's so scruffy I'm too embarrassed to wear it, or it's literally falling apart at the seams. That's why none of my clothes ever end up in a second hand shop. I replace them precisely because they're no use to anyone, <laughs> not just me. I've been doing this for some time now, and I've noticed that clothes used to last a lot longer. The quality's got gradually worse, and I have to replace things far more often than before. You hear two people talking about a friend of theirs. How many houses has Mike got now? Well, there's this one here the flat in Brighton, the cottage in Devon, and that villa of his in Spain. So, four altogether.、Mm, easy for some, isn't it? I don't know. I get the impression he's fed up with it all, always moving around. I wouldn't be surprised if he got rid of everything over here and lived in Spain permanently. Is that what he said he'll do? Well, you know, Mike, it's not like him to talk much about his plans. But he did say he might settle down one day, stay in one place. And you know how much he likes Spain. You overhear a man talking to a friend on his phone. I'm stressed out, to be honest, what with work and all the problems with the house. I need something to help me relax. Well, yeah, I did think about yoga, but the class is on Friday and I play squash then. And then I saw they do Pilates on Tuesdays and Thursdays, which would be ideal for me. Yeah, I know you did. And actually, I was wondering if you could tell me what it was like, what sort of things you did. I had a quick look online, but it's always better to talk to someone with first hand experience. You hear a woman talking about her family's financial situation. 
We just about get by, but it's a bit of a struggle. I can only get part time work, and Frank lost his job at the furniture factory last August. He's sent off loads of applications, but no luck so far. My mum and dad could probably help out, but somehow it doesn't seem right borrowing from them. They've been saving all their lives, and I want them to enjoy their money now they're retired. There's nothing for it but to put my car on the market and see if I can get a decent price for it. The kids will just have to get the bus in the morning. You hear a man talking about his job. I don't get to wear a uniform, you know, with a cap and all, like they do at some of the other hotels, but I do wear a suit. A decent one, tailor made, not just any old suit. Inside at the front desk, they reckon I look smarter than the boss. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that, but I do like to look good for the guests. I'm the first person they see before they go into the hotel. And I've got this long black overcoat as well. It can get pretty cold standing outside on the steps in winter, I can tell you. You hear two people talking about the value of their time spent living abroad. I've gained so much from these two years living abroad. Yeah, me too. I reckon we'll have no trouble finding work when we get back home. I'm not sure that's true. But anyway, I was thinking more about the benefits to me as a person. I've become much more tolerant since I've been here, more willing to accept difference. That's what I mean. We've grown as individuals. We're more open minded and independent. So that makes us more employable. Well, I admire your optimism. I just know that I'll miss being here. It's all right. But the whole thing has made me value life at home more. You hear a man talking on the radio. The world today is faster and more dynamic than when our great grandparents were alive. But as a result, life is often more stressful and unhealthy. Self help gurus offer people the hope of finding a solution to their problems, improving their health and well being, and generally making their lives better. The author of Back to Basics says his guide will help you achieve all these things in a matter of weeks. He's lying. The only thing it's good for is sending you to sleep, and you'd be wasting your money if you bought it, and your time if you read it. You hear two people talking about the village they both live in. Are you enjoying it here in the village? Yes, I am. I think I know nearly everyone now. When I came here last year, everyone went out of their way to introduce themselves and make me feel welcome. That's good. So you feel comfortable here then? Yes, I do. And the children have settled in well too. I just get a bit nervous about the traffic sometimes. What, on the main road? Yes, and a couple of other spots as well. There are certain places I won't let the children go without me. Some drivers just don't slow down for them. You hear a man talking about a country in which he once lived. On my travels, I've had to get used to eating all kinds of strange dishes, so I was prepared for their rather unusual cuisine. If I was offered something I knew I wouldn't like, I used to cover it in lemon and salt to hide the taste. And it's a hot country. So the slow pace of life and relaxed approach to work were only to be expected. What I hadn't anticipated was their way of dressing. I'm not used to being with people who take so much care over what they wear, and I felt quite scruffy by comparison. Colour, style, fashion, it all mattered to them. I had no idea before I went. Hi, I'm Jack Suggs. And on today's programme, we're going to take a look at what's going on in the world of music. Apparently, the average person in Britain listens to around 3,500 songs a year. And in the case of young adults aged between 18 and 24, that figure is more than 6,000, an average of about three and a half hours of music a day. 
Music's all around us, in shops, restaurants, gyms and even the workplace. Not so long ago, the idea of employees listening to music in offices was almost unheard of. Now it's becoming increasingly common. In fact, almost as common as it used to be in factories, where many employers have got rid of it because it can be distracting and an obvious safety risk. In an office, though, it can be very beneficial, depending on what you're trying to achieve. According to some recent research, if the work involves creative thinking, then positive, stimulating music can help you come up with original ideas. But if it's anything that requires problem solving, then it's better to work without any noise at all, including music, of course. Background music can also help increase business in restaurants. There are music streaming services that design playlists to suit different types of restaurants and their brand or image. In a study carried out recently, one such service led to an increase of roughly 11% in the sales of side dishes in one establishment, and orders of smoothies and shakes rose by 15%. Restaurants have to be careful, though, because if they get the music wrong or play it too loud, they can put people off eating and sales will fall. And there's some really interesting research that's been done by scientists at the University of Oxford. They found out that traditional music played in Indian restaurants can make the food taste up to 10% hotter. They haven't worked out exactly why this is yet, but it seems we associate the fast beat and high-pitched distorted sounds of Indian music with high energy, and that reflects the sensation of eating spicy food. Now, if you like watching TV series, you may have noticed that many directors nowadays tend not to use famous musicians and composers to create the soundtracks for their work, but turn instead to relatively unknown artists. The band Survive in Stranger Things, for example, or Mogwai for Les Revenant. And they're such an important part of the process that they often compose the music before filming even begins, and so help to shape the series that's being made. They also use technology to create their sound, so there's less need to hire large orchestras and big studios these days. In fact, there's a move away from the dramatic sounds of the orchestra towards music that doesn't stand out so much. Music that's more in the background, so that it won't distract the viewer. Which is very different to what's happening with video games. Orchestras are an important element of these, and composers like Ema Noon are in constant demand. Ema comes from Ireland, but has set up home in California. She's worked on games like World of Warcraft and Legend of Zelda, which are played by hundreds of millions of people, and she travels the world performing sell-out concerts of her soundtracks. Video game music is also played on the radio. On the commercial station Classic FM, there's a very popular one-hour programme which plays music exclusively from games. Its name, appropriately, is High Score, and it's presented by Jessica Curry, who co-founded a game development company called The Chinese Room and composed the music for the game Dear Esther. Many classical music lovers were sceptical at first, but the first series turned out to be a huge success, so they made more programmes. Now, on this programme, before we go on, you're going to hear a piece of jazz from somebody we all normally associate with rock music, and I want you to decide who it is we're listening to. Octopushing, elephant polo or cheese rolling. Our sports correspondent, Mike Taylor, has been finding out about some of the world's strangest sports. Which is the most unusual one for you, Mike? Well, it has to be chess boxing, because it's such a bizarre combination. A match starts off with a four-minute round of speed chess, followed by a three-minute round of boxing. 
There can be up to six rounds of chess and five of boxing before a winner is decided. It sounds like just a bit of fun, but when I watched two men competing on German television recently, I was amazed by their level of skill in each of these two very different disciplines. After all, boxing is such an aggressive physical sport, whereas chess is all about using the brain. You don't expect a boxer to be good at chess or a chess player to be good in the ring. Have you found any other unusual combinations like that? No, but you mentioned octopushing, which is underwater hockey, so it's an unusual setting for a familiar game. I haven't seen it played, but I've read that it's a very exciting spectator sport. Major tournaments have TV screens that show the images captured by underwater cameras. Apparently, you don't have to be very fit to play. But I'm not convinced. It seems physically very demanding to me. The good thing, though, is that no individual player has to stay underwater for long periods at a time. People like me who can't hold their breath for very long can keep coming up for air. OK. a y What else have you got? Well, one of my favourites is sport stacking, which involves individuals or teams building pyramids with plastic cups. <laughs> It doesn't sound very impressive, nor do competitors need to be in particularly good physical condition. But if you watch a video of some of the best stackers, you'll appreciate just how fast they are. It's quite staggering. There are adult competitions, and I'm thinking of having a go at it myself. But most participants are teenagers and children, some as young as four. Mind you, in sport, we're used to seeing very young competitors outdo older ones, so that's nothing new. Indeed. And are there any of these sports that you definitely wouldn't want to do? Yes, there are. And not because they're in any way tough or there's too much danger involved. Far from it. It's just that I find them a bit ridiculous. There's toe wrestling, retro running, <laughs> that's running backwards, or even pillow fighting, which is now a sport in Japan. They all seem rather silly to me, and they're not sports I'd particularly want to do or even watch. You mentioned toe wrestling. What does that involve? Well, basically, competitors lock big toes and try to force their opponent's foot onto the sideboard of a wooden frame. I mean, it's fine for kids, and a toe wrestling competition is the kind of thing you might expect them to organise in the school playground. But for grown men and women to hold a world championship every year, and then for organisers to apply for toe wrestling to become an Olympic sport, well, it's too daft for words. I'm just pleased the application wasn't accepted. All right. And uh, which of the sports you've seen is the most impressive, would you say? Well, probably the man versus horse marathon, which takes place every July in Wales. Human runners race cross-country against riders on horseback for 22 miles. That's around 35 kilometres. And on two occasions in the last 40 years, a human contestant has won. Now, that's not as astonishing as it might seem. Horses are fast in short races, but not so good over long distances. But it does seem a little unfair that the human victories are not mentioned in the same breath as some of the world's more famous sporting achievements. These people are heroes, but they're virtually unknown outside Wales. Yes, it's the first time I've heard of the race. You're a runner, aren't you, Mike? I was, but I damaged my knee when I was skiing and had to stop. I was a real enthusiast. I used to run for a couple of hours after work every evening. But even then, I wouldn't have beaten a horse, that's for sure. There's no shame in that. Right. Thanks, Mike. Hi, my name's Paul, and I'm going to talk to you about the World Robotics Championship, RoboCup, which I've been looking into on the internet for a project I'm doing. The competition is usually organised in a different country every year, though it's been held no fewer than four times in Japan, which is where the first event took place in 1997. The first time it was hosted here in Australia was in 2000, in Melbourne. 
Now, RoboCup is short for Robot Soccer World Cup, and actually, the ultimate aim of the event is to encourage the development of robots which can beat the Football World Cup champions by 2050. Well, good luck with that, guys. But there are other challenges too, including RoboCup at home and RoboCup at work in the adult competition, and the on stage and rescue categories in RoboCup Junior, which is for kids up to the age of 19. Let me just explain a little bit about the on stage event. Uh, that's where teams get the chance to show what their robots can do through a stage show. And that can be anything from storytelling to a dance or a theatre performance. Or apparently even a magic show, though I didn't find any videos of that one on the internet. The robots generally wear costumes and their designers can be part of the show too. Many of the performers I saw were dressed up as characters from films, but the star of the video I enjoyed most was a robot in a penguin costume. It was great fun and the audience loved it. But there's also a serious side to the whole thing. For example, all the teams have a technical interview with the judges, and each member has to answer questions about the part they played in the design and programming of their robots. And the competition rules are really strict. Points are taken off if a robot moves outside the area that's marked out on the stage, or if a team goes over the time limit. They have a total of five minutes for their performance, which includes setting it up and introducing it, and then an extra minute to clear up. So no more than six minutes altogether on the stage. It's all very quick, so there's no chance for the audience to get bored. I saw some videos of some of the other events as well, like RoboCup Soccer, which is pretty impressive. Uh, what amazed me most about it is the fact that there are no radio signals or remote controls or any other kind of communication from the designers. All the robots are autonomous. They all communicate with each other and make their own decisions about what to do almost like human players, except the ones I saw kept falling over for no apparent reason, which was quite funny to watch. I have to say, though, there was some pretty good passing of the ball, but none of the teams had what you could call a solid defence. Sometimes a robot would kick the ball from one end of the pitch to the other, and the other team just stood by and watched as it went into the goal. But hey, it's good entertainment and a great way for the public to learn about the latest developments in robot technology. For me though, RoboCup at home seemed the most educational event. For this one, designers have to interact with their robots, and the only way they can do that is by voice. A kind of apartment is set up in the venue, and the robots have to follow their designers' spoken instructions to perform a number of different tasks. I saw them do things like open the curtains in the bedroom or go into the kitchen and get something like a bottle or a cup and take it back to the designer who was in the lounge. This kind of thing might become a reality in the home in the future, so it's really interesting to see robots doing things in this context. Next year we're starting lessons at 10 rather than 9 every day. The head says teenagers need more sleep than adults and they'll be more receptive during class if they come in an hour later. It's a fairly radical idea and it's attracting a lot of attention from the press. I just think it's another one of the head's schemes to get publicity for herself. She clearly has her own interests at heart rather than those of the kids. Perhaps I should have spoken out at the consultation meeting, but she's got the support of the whole teaching staff, and they don't seem to care that her motives are all wrong. I'm really fed up with our head of department. We all are. As well as having absolutely no interpersonal skills, he has a habit of making changes without bothering to find out what anyone else thinks first. He told us in a meeting last week that we're going to be using a different course book for Year 8 next term and he's ordered three class sets already. I'm not saying that a change wasn't necessary. I think we're all a bit tired of the book we're using at the moment. But I do think he could have let us have some say in the matter before going ahead. 
It's no way to run a department. Until now, a student's end of term report consisted of a mark for each subject, followed by a summarising comment from the tutor. With the new system, each subject teacher has to write a comment as well. And since I teach maths to as many as 200 students every year, it'll take me absolutely ages. The head says the tutor's comment isn't enough to give parents a full picture of how their child's getting on. But I think it's fine, as long as it's carefully written. Most parents won't read the comments anyway. They're just interested in the marks. It's a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. And I know the majority of my colleagues feel the same. The situation in Year 10 is not much better than it was before. Mixing up the classes like that, splitting up the troublemakers, is a step in the right direction, but it doesn't go far enough. They're still there and they're still causing disruption to lessons. The head should have asked the parents to come in and got the kids to make certain guarantees in front of them, made them promise to improve their behaviour and so on. Then, if the promises aren't kept, expel them from the school. We told her that, but she said expelling them would just create problems for other schools. She needs to be much tougher. There's some building work going on outside the music room. The windows are double glazed, but they're not thick enough to keep out the noise, so I've been moved to a room on the other side of the school. I've changed rooms many times before, but never to one as bad as this. The ceiling's high, and the acoustics are terrible for the piano. Plus, I have to shout to make myself heard so my throat is suffering, and then the sun streams in during the afternoon and sends the kids to sleep. I'm telling you, as soon as the work's finished, I'm moving straight back to my old room. You hear a man talking to a friend about a TV series he is watching. Enjoying the new series? Well, yeah, it's OK. The writers have done a great job with the storyline. It draws you in, makes you want to keep watching, like a book you can't put down. It's a shame about the actual script, though. I mean, the actors do their best with their lines, but they all sound very unnatural. And people are saying good things about the music, but I really don't understand why they've used modern songs in a series set in the 1920s. So you're not a fan, then? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I watched three episodes in a row last night. You hear a woman reviewing a book on the radio. All too often we are told that the author takes us on a journey. But the phrase is entirely appropriate for this, the first volume of Gray's Memoirs, since each chapter is named after a different European location where she lived out a particular stage of her colourful life. At times, it reads like a novel set against a background of huge political change across the continent. But this is the story of a life in which fact is stranger and far more absorbing than fiction. The map at the beginning of the book is a useful addition, by the way, as many of the place names may be unfamiliar to you. You hear two friends talking about a film they have just seen. I thought the pace dropped a bit halfway through the film, but apart from that it was really good. Yeah, it was great. You never expect a sequel to compare well with the original, but in many ways this one was better, more entertaining. Especially the bits with those twins. I haven't laughed so much in ages. <laughs> yeah, I didn't laugh out loud like you. I never do, but I know what you mean. Definitely a candidate for an award or two. Right. But it's true, the director could have speeded up the action a bit in the middle. You hear a man telling a woman about a storytelling course he attended. So, what made you decide to do a storytelling course? Well, a friend of mine who did it last year recommended it to me. She thought I might enjoy it, and she was right. It was great fun, really laid back, and everyone was very supportive. It gave me the courage I needed, and the self-belief, to be able to stand up and speak in front of a group of people.
So, are you going to be leaving us to take up a career as a storyteller then? No, I like working here too much. <laughs> That's a good story. You overhear a woman calling a bookshop. Hello, yes. It's about a book I bought in your shop last week, a Catherine Adams novel. I just wanted to point out that there were one or two pages missing. And no, no, there's really no need to apologise. I mean, it's not as if it was the last page or anything. And I got the gist of what was happening without the pages. I just thought you ought to know so you can check the rest of your stock or talk to the publishers or something. Well, that's OK. Yes, pages 60 to 63. You hear a man talking to a friend about a story writing competition he won. Hey, I saw you on the telly last night talking about your competition win. You kept that quiet. Well, yeah, it was a bit of an ordeal, to be honest. Why is that? Well, it's a live chat show, so I was worried I might make a mess of it. But you'd already been on national radio. Yeah, but I didn't have to say much then. Just read the story out. That's much easier than talking about yourself in front of millions. And anyway, I wasn't surrounded by all those celebrities when I was on the radio. It was just me and the other three finalists in the studio with a presenter. You hear two friends talking about an actor in a play they have just seen. The actor who played the grandfather looked familiar. Did you recognise him? Yeah, I did. I've seen him in one or two of those period dramas on telly. He usually plays much younger characters, though. He can't be much older than 40. <laughs> well, makeup did a good job then. He looked very convincing. Yeah, he did. And his movements and gestures were really authentic. He's a natural. Right. But I did think he tried a bit too hard with the voice. He mumbled a lot, so it wasn't easy to make out what he was saying sometimes. Yeah, I had trouble understanding him too. You hear part of a talk by a writer. Now, you're all avid readers, so you know all about the wonders of books. Your bookshelves are probably full of novels, some of them mine, hopefully. And it's likely you started reading from an early age. So it may surprise you to know that until I was 15, I had never actually read a book from beginning to end. My parents didn't read, and nor did I. Then one day, a local writer came to my school and read extracts from her latest novel, and I was hooked. I bought the book, and when I finished it, I knew exactly what I wanted to do in life. Hello, my name's Mike Swift, and I'm here today to talk to you about the City College and the different vocational courses we run there. Now, until fairly recently, we had four different faculties at the college, but with the addition of the Creative Skills faculty last year, there are now five altogether. We're really proud of this new faculty. There are workshops for glass production, ceramics and textiles, as well as a state-of-the-art photography studio and the college's very own radio station, which broadcasts every weekday to the local area. The star attraction, though, is the television studio, the only one of its kind in a further education college in this region. I think it's worth mentioning that most of the first group of students who were on our media courses last year have already found jobs in the business. There's one working as a camera woman, for example, quite a few sound or lighting engineers, and even, in one case, a radio producer, which is pretty good going for a 21-year-old. No presenters as yet, but you never know. Now, the biggest building in the college is the Faculty of Leisure and Health, which offers over 200 courses in anything from sports coaching or alternative therapies to catering or cake decoration. But the fastest growing courses in this faculty are those in the events department, with more and more students hoping to go into careers as exhibition organisers, concert promoters or wedding coordinators. 
These are great courses because if you decided to change careers at any point in the future, most of what you've learnt would still be useful to you. Organisational skills, for example, are important in a whole range of jobs, and so is good team management, knowing how to deal with a group of people who work under your supervision. And there's something else about this type of course which makes it so attractive, and which is common to courses in some of the other faculties too. During the second term, the college organises work experience in local venues and businesses. You get a chance to find out what it's like to do the job for a few weeks, and you get paid too, so that can't be bad. Now, some of you, I'm sure, will be interested in working in IT. Well, we offer over eighty different information technology courses. Some of them in the Faculty of Building and Engineering, like CAD, for example, which stands for Computer Aided Architectural Design. But the majority are taught in the Business Faculty. Computer games development is a popular choice and can lead to employment as a games developer working in design, programming, art, or animation. But competition is high, and the entry requirements are quite strict. We're looking for exam passes in at least five subjects, including English, and we particularly want to see good grades in maths. Computer science is also a big advantage, of course. Incidentally, if you're not sure what course to take, the college does have a student support service, which will help you choose the right one. You can arrange for an interview with the careers advice team before you apply, or else you can go to our online site and click on the study options heading for lots of helpful information and tips. Now, before I go on, I ought to mention that most of our courses last for just under a year, from September to June, and they're either full-time courses, meaning five days a week, or part-time, which are just one or two days a week. But we do also have a number of evening courses, which usually run for five months, and that brings me on to the different qualifications you can achieve. On the various courses.